Okay, so imagine you're responding to a facility with known chemical storage tanks. How do you execute a safe response when you roll in? Well, today we'll cover containers and what you need to know. I'm Grant Coffey, and this is FLIR Primed. One of the key foundations of FLIR Primed is knowledge. This equates to competence in your profession, and that means a safer work environment for your personnel. Now, episode 10 of FLIR Primed, I introduced the concept of the three C's, chemical, container, and context. A simple tool to assist in the situational assessment when responding to a chemical release. Well, today we're gonna to build on what you learned to take a deeper dive into the types of containers that you may encounter. First, remember every chemical or compound has hazardous properties based on the amount, the state of matter, or the concentration. Identifying the specific chemical name or chemical family is a critical response step. And understanding the context, that means what's going on around you, is very important. Here are some general guidelines to consider during a container response. What do we know about the container? Like, when and where did we find it? Is the container marked or labeled? And can we be sure that this is an accurate indication of the contents of the container? Is the container full? Is it empty or is it just half full? What are the implications of this? Is there an active process ongoing impacting whether it's full or being emptied? Is there a potential hazmat situation if the chemical is released? And is it damaged, leaking, displaying active signs that there's a reaction inside the container like heat, bulging, or pinging sounds? Is it day or night? What's the ambient temperature outside and what's the wind direction and speed? Is this container orphaned or abandoned with unknown quality and unidentified composition? Remember to visit FLIR.com and snag the download for this episode which contains more cues and clues from container responses. Well now let's talk about what's inside the container for a minute. Many times the actual chemical product will determine the package or container type. Remember that chemicals can react inside the container and also when released based on several factors including heat, pressure, catalyst, the chemical state, the individual chemical nature, specific activation energy, how energetic is the individual product, subdivision, meaning how finely divided the product is, and the reaction rate can actually double with the increase of only about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That means with even a modest increase in external heat, the chemical inside a container can react at a surprising rate. In fact, the first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy can't be created or destroyed. This means, among other things, that added energy to a chemical in a closed container can accelerate the process of the release of even more energy that's contained inside the individual chemical compounds. Are you starting to get the picture now? How dangerous this situation can turn. Well, each individual chemical has varying amounts of energy and every time a reaction happens, excess energy is released, but if that energy is contained, and depending upon conditions, there can be a proportional increase in pressure inside the container, causing a rapid pressure increase. Common example of the potential for chemical energy is with acetylene. Some chemicals have single bonds, acetylene has triple. It can quickly release a great deal of energy. So what are some types of containers that you might encounter? Okay, there are three general categories of containers. The type, shape, and construction of the individual cylinder is one important clue to the nature of the hazardous product inside. Smaller, non-bulk packages or containers are one class. Examples would be drums, small cylinders, labeled boxes, some with even smaller containers inside. Another would be bulk transport vehicles. These are larger tractor, trailer, or rail car size containers including several classes, intermodal, pressure, non-pressure, dry hopper cars, corrosive, and cryogenic. Stationary bulk storage is another group. Large chemical storage tanks at an individual plant, hospital, or refinery, airport, etc. Now, small containers can be found anywhere and range in size from pint bottles to 60-gallon drums or medium-sized pressure cylinders. And here's a few tips for this class. Box-type packaging 
can contain multiple classes and will have hazard labels on the outside. But watch out for the dangerous placard. It isn't specific, but alerts you to multiple chemicals and the potential for mixing if a vehicle is overturned or on fire. Now this class will often be common in, in bulk stores, small businesses and residential deliveries inside trucks. A watch out here is context. Okay, so say you respond to a residence and find hundreds of small LPG containers inside the home and or with the presence of other suspicious items. Does that evidence fit? And if it doesn't, what does that tell you about the danger? Bulk transport vehicles are most often via rail car or a tractor trailer on a highway. Now I'd like to stress four general container types in this class and a few blevy or boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion watch outs. Non-pressure cars. Now these are generally single wall, much like a, a water bottle, liquid inside with no pressurized gas component. Not a huge blevy hazard, but the use of a thermal imaging camera can help you determine the level of the liquid inside and assist in your assessment about the failure potential for the tank shell above the level of the liquid. Second one is pressurized. This is typical for propane, liquefied petroleum gas products. The obvious difference from the non-pressure water bottle type are the more rounded ends and with a heavy access hash with very heavy bolts. The blevy potential here is high because this product is already at high pressure, can't stand the input of much more heat. Corrosive cars, they're pretty easy to identify as these liquid products are relatively heavy and therefore the diameter of their containers from the end are smaller. These containers have the presence also of external stiffening rings or structural support, much like you see in bamboo plants at the joints. Not a huge blevy hazard here either. Now cryogenic is a special class. This container type has a double wall like a thermos bottle with an insulating vacuum space in between for insulation. Now this product is very cold and these will have doors on the side or end with piping and equipment to keep the contents cold. Easy to identify. Once these containers have been compromised, the contents can warm up very quickly and expand depending on the product to well over 600 times. So the blevy factor here is higher also. For stationary bulk storage at a fixed facility, the quantities are greater, but you generally have a known chemical hazard and commonly have on-site responsible parties that know about the product and the container systems. Some things to keep in mind here. The products can vary, but it's common for these to contain thousands of gallons of hazardous materials, both in liquid and gas states. You need to familiarize your team with these facilities and understand the typical products that are normally found on these sites in your area. Develop a relationship with the facility chemist or engineer. These are great resources for you. If at night you're unfamiliar with the processes or there are bulk chemicals at a given fixed facility, pay heed to the required 704 placard on the exterior of the building. It'll give you a number for the level of the hazard for three chemical characteristics, plus a helpful general section at the bottom in white for special hazard logos. One caution here. That 704 will give you a general idea of the worst type of hazard present in that building on site, but it will not tell you what the specific products are, how much the products are present, and where they're present in the facility. And by the way, some of these facilities are huge. As you can see, there are many types of containers and potential for many products stored in these containers, but what's the bottom line? You need to use a primed approach by preparing with good information and good training. Establish conservative safety zones until your assessment is complete. And use your available reference tools like the DOT guidebook, the SDS sheets, bills of lading, on-scene placards or labels. In addition, take advantage of any expert plant representative if they're available. They could be your best friend. Utilize chemical monitors, ticks, or even a GCMS to assist in your situational evaluation and specific identification of chemicals. Knowing your business, taking a cautious approach, and the time to make a safe decision is the way to go. Now remember to get the download for this episode at flare.com slash primed. I'm Grant Coffey and thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next episode.